Hey, David, how are you? I am awesome. Thank you for this invitation. No, thank you for joining us. Super excited for our quick little chat today. Um, and everyone else joining us, good afternoon and welcome back to Plain Speak, the podcast where we bridge the gap between technology and the realities of customer support, bringing insights directly from the leaders who are shaping the future of customer experience today. Super thrilled, David, thank you for joining us to have David Wilson join the show with us today. David is a seasoned expert in customer service and experience experience with a career spanning over 25 years of experience working with brands like Capital One, Uber, Chime, and DoorDash. He is currently the founder of Impactify CX, focusing on driving performance improvements through empathy, advocacy, action, and expanding BPO operations in Africa. Excited to learn more about that in a little bit. Um, I'm your host, Liz Tai, CEO and founder of High Operator. We're committed to revolutionizing customer support through our cutting edge solutions like High Auto, as well as our suite of self-service tools, High Q, which include Highlight, QA Scout, and SuperSat. Our platforms leverage a little bit of NLP, workflow automation, and generative AI to help manage complex customer interactions, ensuring seamless and efficient support. To everyone tuning in, please feel free to engage with us through the chat during our podcast. Um, anything else we'll follow up with um, after our session. And with that, let's dive into our chat with David on this episode of Plain Speak. Welcome again, David. Where are you coming into us today from? <laughs> so I'm in New York City this week attending a couple of events. Very nice. So a little bit after lunch. So I appreciate you putting that off to chat with us here. And maybe to start us off, David, given your really exciting sort of long history in customer support, tell us a little bit about your journey into support and how it's led you all the way through to your current role uh, at Impactify CX. Um, absolutely. So my my look, I've been in the business a long time, as you say. Um, I think my uh, journey. <laughs> My journey began, um, I'm actually an, a seasoned musician and uh, spent uh, my or some of my earlier years at uh, Berkeley College of Music, where I think some of my creativity comes from. But, you know, soon transitioned into a role that was uh, creating one of the first tech disruptors in the insurance industry. Back then, we called them uh, dot coms. Um, and, but this kind of unique start allowed me to understand the value of thoroughness and, and customer interactions pretty early on. And so I think my significant leap came uh, during my time at Capital One, where, you know, I honed my skills in understanding customer behavior, uh, experience and journey mapping, and a lot of experimentation with um, with the customer behavior. And so it was a great training ground for me to learn how to balance business outcomes and, and customer outcomes pretty effectively. And so then when I parlay that into um, experiences at Uber, where there was massive scale and, you know, got to learn uh, a lot more about how to um, had an impact globally here. Um, and then my time at Chime and where we first met and my uh, uh, time at DoorDash also further shaped my perspective, especially regarding the importance of empathy um, in understanding where your customers are in their journey. I'm a strong believer also in looking around to leverage the best of ideas that are out there and adopt yeah. where appropriate. Um, a good example of this was the work that the um, Customer Contact Council uh, did when it was in its format before it was uh, acquired by Gartner. Uh, they would regularly offer research papers with really practical suggestions on new and exciting directions and experience philosophies that help me understand how to move quality. And, you know, look, my 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 beginnings are I was an agent back in the day, and understanding that side of the experiences and how tough it can be to deal with customers all through you know their their own journeys with yeah, you. Literally. You know, for reference. <laughs> I, yeah, for reference, I, I I was an agent with the Canadian version of the IRS, so the Canada Revenue Agency. And that's some pretty tough conversations that you can have. And so wow. over the years, I spent time in, in each of the servicing disciplines to understand the better, like L&D, quality, vendor management, workforce management. And so today, where I am with uh, Impactify.cx, it's combining all these various experiences across industries, the joy of experimentation, the deeper understanding of what constitutes great. And so my goal here is to revolutionize customer um, interactions by infusing every touch point with empathy, a deep understanding of customer needs while you know uh, having a strong focus on helping new markets in Africa expand into the BPO world. 
Fascinating. I love that arc that you took us through because, you know, starting as an Asian, right, that's one very specific set of empathy and experiences and skill sets, but obviously very different at scale, right, with yep. Capital One and insurance. And then probably also very different at scale when growing very, very quickly, right, at places like DoorDash and Chime. So excited to dive more into that, especially from that human aspect that maybe BPOs at scale don't necessarily think about all the time. Um, mm -hmm. So to sort of double click on that, you know, across all of those different roles and scales and in different industries, how do you sort of think about an approach leveraging that community and personalization to enhance customer experience at scale? Yeah, look, it's not easy because there's this juxtaposition of your company wants to do one thing and think this is the experience that we want to deliver. And then you have, you know, the front line who have their own ideas on how to be successful within their roles and earn, you know, the kind of recognition that they want. But the community and personalization are at the heart of an excellent customer experience. And I think, you know, back in the Capital One days, uh, we focused on the full uh, customer journey, which included mapping out um, overall experiences, individual journeys, and, and then how do you combine this with data to predict and address what customers are needing proactively. I think proaction is, proactivity, sorry, is something that I'm, you know, very uh, focused on. And so these principles can, you know, carried me through my roles at Uber and DoorDash where I, you know, community engagement and that um, concept of personalized support were pretty important. And I think, you know, by knowing where customers are in their journey, being in their shoes, and then finding a way to recognize the emotion of the moment, whether it's high or low, um, uh, adding in that um, empathy, being reacting to the urgency of the situations. I think the the goal is to make customers feel heard and valued through the experience. Yeah. Um, you know, in the tech world, there's like there's a real closeness between operations, strategy, product, engineering, and that allows everybody to to contribute the best towards the overall experiences. And I've seen some terrific uh, successes um, in community experience, uh, community participation, where you engage with your customers as ambassadors or evangelists and, you know, even be part of the delivery of support. I'm not sure if you're, yeah. you, there was a product out there called Directly, where super end users could be ambassadors for a brand and they could be answering um, questions themselves on behalf of people who were just like them. Um, you know, the, the gig work industry is, is a bit lonely at times. And so having a sense of community around you is, um, is you know, it's, it's, as long as the answers are super accurate and reliable, you know, you do feel part of a of, of a community, and and it gives you a confidence in the work that you're you're doing. And so, I think to me, that's where I believe the true power of community and personalization can really add to an experience. Sure. No. Yeah. We've talked about this with some previous guests, but you know, you, have, you do have a lot of products and services where you end up with sort of super users, right? They may not be yeah. experts on the inner workings of the company, but they know a lot about the specific product or use case that your users are trying to engage with, possibly more so that you can get an agent ramped up to, right, over the course yeah. of a couple months. So it's really cool to think about expanding and leveraging that network. Now, you said something really interesting at the beginning of this, David, as well, which is that, you know, there's sort of this at the macro level, right? Brands have identities. They know how they want to engage with their customers, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the front lines, you have agents who face a different set of pressures. Even if they're macro aligned, they face the different set of pressures of, I've got a phone call right here. I've got a chat right here. I've got to do something mm -hmm. right now, right? And that's maybe a different mindset than you know, someone who's at the exec level or at a product or engineering level, it's a different time scale. Are right. there so many examples that have stood out to you in the past of how you translate, right, that experience of the front line all the way back to make sure that the brands and the voices and that design sort of meets in the middle? Wow, that's a really great question. I would say um, a good example of this is recently um, at DoorDash, there are, <laughs> There's a group of customers that are really super high uh, users of, of DoorDash, including myself, by the way. Um, and I think um, what we decided to do is a bit of an experiment here so that we could learn what is it that we need to do to change our policies and therefore potentially impact product and engineering along the way. And the goal wow. here was what we said to the, we, we just 
did it really scrappily. We put everybody together. We put 30 agents in a room and we said, you know what? We just want you to be empathetic. We want you to do whatever it is that the customer wants so that we can learn from this. And over time, I think what we found was agents themselves with the freedom and releasing them from the tyranny of policy alignment or compliance, um, they they didn't go way off board. They, they still did the right thing for you know, for DoorDash, they, they did the right thing for customers. Yeah. Um, I think that what we were learning from this journey was there was real value in how might we actually better prepare the front line because they were actually looking into the histories of customers so that they could connect with them in a very different way. Um, and then starting to iterate because they looked like they were really understanding the journey that the, the, the customers were looking for. And so you can actually get a lot of learnings from this. Um, and I will also say that you know, I, I'm a firm believer that, and I, we've done some research to understand this, customers actually know what it is they want from you more than 90% of the time. They are not coming with real questions. They're coming with a plan and they want you to right. enact this plan because if they if they could have done it themselves within the, you know, the availability of the functions in the app, they would have, but they've had to take time out of their day to be able to connect with you. And so they're looking for a handshake. How can I hand over what I want done for me? Look, it's not always about saying yes, but at least it's about that understanding that if from an empathetic perspective, I already know what it is I want from you. And so if companies would listen to their customers and watch their behavior and understand that when they come to you, they actually already know what they want. I think there's a lot of learnings that can be done from there. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, just trying to match the expectation and then learning from the front line what's working and what they're thinking through um, to try That's and right. replicate it. Yeah. Super, super cool. No, appreciate you sharing that, David. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where it bridges into what we talked a little bit more about, which is, you know, with your extensive background in operations across, as you said, all the disciplines, right, engaged yeah. in delivering customer experience. Uh, are there any sort of key strategies or takeaways that sort of have stood out that you've implemented to drive you know, the, the gears, right? The operational excellence behind the scenes while still maintaining from the customer's perspective, a very customer centric approach. Yeah, I think look, over, over the years, as I've added on through each step of my career, I'm more and more obsessed with empathy as that mm -hmm. pathway that you're talking about. And this isn't just empathy for customers, by the way, this is also empathy for your front line. And, and that means happy agents equals happy customers a lot of the time. And so integrating empathy into the operational processes is really important, but it's a massive transformation at a company level who may not really understand, but actually get what you're trying to do, but not, not connecting to it in the same way. So the massive tran uh, transformation that we did within uh, DoorDash and, and prior roles as well, uh, means that training teams have to understand, um, they have to be able to teach folks how to respond to customer emotions and needs and understanding what that sense of urgency about the situation is for them. Um, and so that also then translates into, well, you know, I get that you understand where I am and not, that's good for, for me. However, this also has to translate into some kind of action. And so um, we, we focus on moving towards action, incorporating advocacy, um, so that we could reduce the friction in the processes themselves. You know, your very best customers should have zero friction in any process. And as you and I both know, the best customer service is no customer service, right? But since we we have to, we have to make sure that we're we're um, uh, our policies allow for flexibility um, and that kind of you know ability to recognize in this moment that there's something different needed. And I'll give you an example of this, a quick example. Um, yeah. Say you work for a food delivery service um, and you are an agent on the front line. You get a call from a frantic uh, mother who had ordered uh, 24 hamburgers for her kid's birthday. Now, if you're just calling up saying, hi, I'm missing a hamburger, it's a very different action than somebody who has 24 hungry kids sitting oh, in front so of good. you. Yeah. And not only that, but now you have 24 moms and dads staring at you going, oh, she really failed. And then a child who has to go to school the next day who thinks, oh my God, my birthday was a failure. Everyone's going to make fun of me. That's a very different level of empathy and understanding of that situation that should spur very different actions 
reactions and responses. And so overall, if you have that kind of empathy built in and you have the flexibility in your processes, um, then you know you feel empowered as an agent. Um, and so you give them tools and you give them autonomy to make decisions um, so that they can provide that very best outcome uh, in, ter in terms of support to customers. That makes a ton of sense. It's sort of like what you would as a human naturally do, but giving them the sort of empowerment to go off and do it. Now, the question though that I have, David, is, you know, at scale, you've got to measure and instrument these things. How does one yep. measure and train empathy? Is it, are you looking at CSAT? Are you looking at sort of the end metrics, LTV? How, how do you, when you, when you implement those programs and try and reshape those programs, how do you track and measure success? Yeah, look, I mean, that's a great question because you have to, otherwise you don't know if you're being successful or not. Um, you know, look, uh, through the years I've uh, I've looked at MP NPS, I've looked at CSAT. I mean, we're all concerned about first contact resolution. Um, yeah. I think that at the end of the day, it's you design, um, you do your best to design a, a process uh, that will allow for this kind of um, flexibility. Um, and then what you do is you you measure it afterwards um, in a way that makes sense for what you're actually going after. I can't tell you how many times I've I've talked to companies who have a 35 to 55 to 75 question QA scorecard um, that measures <laughs> things like you know did did you say you know did you say David three times during the conversation? And look, I understand the intent of all of this, but I think it kind of misses the mark and. Uh, dilutes the focus of your quality uh, measurement itself. And so how do you measure empathy? You you find a couple of questions that really measure it. And so um, oh, through the years, I think one important question to me is, um, do I, as, and, and by the way, I, I would recommend um, putting the voice of your QA scorecard in the customer's voice. It's a difficult transition because you know you're you're as a quality assessor, you're frequently you're you're probably thinking about what the, the company policies are. But if you put your mind to the customers, if you're really trying to get empathy, then your your question should be worded so that you're actually doing it in the voice of the customer. So for instance, do I as the customer think that this agent understood why I'm here today? I think that's a super important question. And then follow ah. that up with another question that says, do I as the customer think that this agent met me where I am today? I think the combination of those two questions allows you to have that kind of um, empathetic uh, measurement that you're really looking for. You don't really need a whole lot, but you know what the problem is? You have a massive uh, workforce. And so you have to make sure that everybody's on board, uh, the, the change management plan and the communication, the amount of calibrations that we had to do as a global team, just to make yeah. sure that we all were relatively within the same understanding of what empathy and what the answers to those questions are. This does not happen overnight. This is a change that takes at least six months to accomplish to make sure that the larger your, your workforce is, that the more time you devote to making it happen. And then the last thing I'll say on this is, then you also have to have really great executive buy-in because you know, that that power. And I will say that, you know, at DoorDash, I really felt like I had that kind of support right from the very top. Tony Zhu is somebody that I feel is super connected to the customer experience. And he really wants the he wants these edges from his his processes removed. And, you know, I felt like I felt pretty supported um, during my time at DoorDash that that was, in fact, what we were trying to to accomplish globally. And we did do some really massive changes in, in the customer experience that way. No, I can't imagine because that, especially across global geos, it must mean something a little bit different right out the gate to everyone. So having to calibrate across the teams and align that must be a heck of a job, honestly. It's a heck of a job. And you know what? I think what I also learned from this whole journey is not everybody's going to make it. Right. This is not a role for everybody. And that's not just agents. That's also management as well. Like I think in more than one occasion, I've had to wish people farewell on the next steps of their journey. Because if you if you don't really get empathy and despite whatever training we can give you, if you're not really there, then it's probably not the right position for you to be in. So, you know, plenty of uh, changes on the front line and management in order to make sure that we were being um, true to the goals that we were trying to do with empathy. I love that. That's truly like the North Star, then it sounds like from a program perspective for you. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I was having conversations uh, last week in, at CCW Vegas with some folks that were talking about the difference between sympathy and empathy. And a, really? a quick example of this is um, if you're, you're calling 911 um, and your house is on fire, mm -hmm. um, do you want the 911 operator to say to you, oh, I'm so sorry that this is <laughs> happening to you. Um, if it were me, I would be just as frustrated. Or do you want that person to say, I'm bringing the hose? That's yeah. empathy and sympathy. Sympathy is reactive and it's mm -hmm. it's a moment in time. It doesn't, it's not really actionable. Empathy is actionable. I will bring the hose. Yeah. And that's exactly why, you know, we were trying to tie empathy to action. And by the way, there's a great book on this. It's um, Empathy in Action by uh, Dr. Natalie Pettahoff. Um, it's a must read. I love the book. It was a, truly a blueprint for, for me. Um, I fought my way to meet uh, Dr. Nat, as we call her affectionately, and uh, spend some time working with her to understand how she could help us on our journey as well. Sure. Empathy as action. Empathy yeah. in action, Dr. <laughs> Natalie Pettahoff. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll check that out and we'll post a little bit about that. Um, super appreciate you sharing. I know we have time for probably just two more questions here. One, a little bit sure. open ended, David. I mean, we talked a lot about empathy and scale and <clears throat> rolling that across larger programs. You know, as we sit here in 2024, the age of AI and automation and all the mm. generative magic, you know, are there any major trends that you think? you see shaping the future of overall customer experience, particularly when it comes to online communications and platforms? Yeah, look, the, the CCW Vegas con conference last week was all about AI and, and the yes. AI, uh, sorry, AI that's coming. Um, uh -huh. First, I'll start, start by saying that I think my takeaways so far on all of this is that um, nobody really knows what AI can do yet. I think there's a lot of really great work that's going on out there. And I think, you know, I don't think that everybody truly understands how to do it, but here's here's some thoughts that I think um, that I've had. I think it helps in this movement towards greater personalization and immediacy. I think customers, you know, they expect interactions that are tailored to their needs and desires. And, you know, this means how do you use um, advanced analytics and AI to predict and address these needs proactively? Um, and then I think the other, another trend is just this uh, integration of support across all touch points, um, whether someone's um, engaging online or in store through an app, um, the experience should be consistent. And I think that's also really important. And I think it should be intuitive. There's too many apps I think that I've gone through where I'm like, how do I get, I don't even know how to get in touch with support through through this app. And so um, intuitiveness is also something. Um, so I think the growing focus for me on empathy and human touch in, intera in customer interactions is couldn't be a bit of a game changer for you. I think technology plays a crucial role in, a, it's a, in the ability to connect with customers on a personal level. And I, I think that's not going to change. Um, I just hope that we have more and more options for us to, to to be able to separate out. And I was actually pretty excited by the Apple AI um, announcement moving away from large language models to the SLMs because I actually yep. think that maybe there's power there that we haven't actually really um, tapped out on yet. And so I'm excited about how um, AI is going to change, but I'm also wary of um, some of the blind spots um, that we have. You know, yeah. I think I think if you don't have great fundamentals in place, AI is not going to be your friend at all. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we were trying to do a bit of a co-pilot uh, experiment. It took several months because as we were going through this transformation uh, within our customer service um, philosophy, I think that we were using um, as training for the AI model, some of the older types of conversations that we really didn't want to see anymore. And so it unfortunately slowed down our progress. But once we figured out that we have to put the very best of our conversations in this model to train it, then it, we started to see some, some movement forward. So making sure the fundamentals are in place are there because otherwise you're just going to do wrong things faster or you're just doing AI for the sake of, of doing AI, yeah. you know? Then I also think another trend should be, I hope this is one, is uh, making sure that as much um, investment into your customer experience is done for the agent side as well. If you yeah. do have agents, because let's face it, you know, like some of these companies are very large, have several thousand agents, 
Uh, they're not going away anytime soon, but in the meantime, you can help them be more prepared and delivered. And by that, I mean, how about, you know, knowledge base articles go away and just one input field where you can say, you know, hey, Siri, um, tell me what this uh, process is in, in the 30 words or less. And I think um, that's also something that can be done. If you can use um, AI to connect your customers to the journey that they're having within your app and know about it before they get to you, you can pretty much accurately predict what somebody is going to ask you and how you can most help them. So I think, um, I think you can use AI in human conversations. I see a trend in this as well. Um, but I think prepping, prompting, and providing the agents with the kind of info is will make those uh, uh, interactions pretty valuable um, for customers and also pretty short and uh, sweet for the, the p and I think, too. So I do, I do yeah. see a world a few years from now where AI is handling the majority of interactions. It's, ah. you know, I think it, its first job would be to, you know, like uh, replace some of the automated work that we already have in place today. Because again, the trouble with automated bots is you can only get so far before you hit a brick wall and you have to be transferred. But I think AI can help um, these chatbots become smarter and then take over um, the the uh, interaction. But I also still think that there's every reason to have live agents because there are tough situations, complexities involved, um, uh, additional permissions needed. Um, the trust and safety world will always need um, agents as well. And so yeah. that's where, you know, AI helps reduce your, your incoming, but then also helps support a really uh, strong interaction. I love it. There's so much in there, right? Um, but it sounds like you're laying the foundation, then you can leverage all of the AI and there's this potential for magic and really a ton of anticipation and really bridging, bridging the experience for the customer. Mm -hmm. Gosh. A lot to unpack there that we'll have to yep. save for next time, possibly. Um, and, and then maybe one quick follow-up, a question from our audience here, David, is mm -hmm. I think this is sort of in vain of what we were just talking about here, is when you think about both, you have remote teams, hybrid teams, you have new technologies, AI coming in. Within that landscape, any quick tips or follow-ons from our conversation earlier on effective strategies on how to foster that culture of empathy within a call center team? Yeah. Um, look, I think I think it takes a vision first, mm -hmm. and that I, I have. You know, I've worked in some companies that, that believe in having a strong vision. Others, maybe not so much. But I think you have to have a vision. What is it that you're going for, and then create a six month plan to execute. Understand what the high level metrics are that you want to achieve, and then set expectations that um, that the leads for each team are responsible for creating to to get there. Because I think, you know, I I think this is a learned behavior to to a certain degree, and it the the onus should be on those that are coming up through the next layers of your organization should also have that ability and that exposure to the creativity that they're going to need in order to get there. Um, I, I personally also think that failure is great. I think that as long as you're learning something, then, you know, fail and fail fast and limit the blast exposure, the blast radius uh, that, that, you know, uh, some of my best mentors have told to me. Um, I also think there's lots of great conferences and research papers that are out there that can provide a good foundation for understanding um, empathy. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, maybe it's a, co a company, a general company culture as well. What I love about DoorDash's culture is that experimentation was the day and everybody wanted to have the results of their experimentation um, posted and publicly reviewed. Um, yeah. And I think it helped really drive some some proactivity by some folks to make sure that they included experimentation. So and then yeah. lastly, I would think just good feedback, a good feedback loop will help you understand how what you're what you've what you're doing right, what you're not doing right, and allow for that that course correction along the way. Um, and you know, you can certainly incentivize this by you know um, small prizes and recognition awards. So I think all of that to me makes sense to create a good culture. I love it. So we started with empathy. We talked about sort of scaling empathy at scale, how to instrument, how to measure that, and then sort of bring us back a little bit, David, to what you're working on today with Impactify. Right, so sort of back to the people a little bit. Tell tell us a little bit about yeah. that, the motivation, and what that means. 
Yeah, I, you know, I've always been fascinated with the concept of impact sourcing. And for the viewers out there that may not know what this is, it's how do you actually help invest through dollars um, into a geographically disadvantaged area and make a, an impact on the local community through um, the investment of those dollars. And so um, at DoorDash, uh, again, I was very supported to take a journey into uh, finding a location. And what we what we figured out was with partnering with the uh, Nelson Mandela Legacy Foundation, South Africa was a great soft landing spot for us because there was some infrastructure, but also real strong needs within the townships um, of the, the big cities where unemployment was 65 percent plus wow. and so so impact sourcing is how do you take a portion of your bpo spend and redirect it to um an area that really could do with the with the, the dollars themselves as zondwa mandela would say he says a lot he says trade not aid and so um i'm at that point in my life now in my career where you know i'm looking for the legacy looking to how can i give back and so what I'm trying to do now with Impactify is convince more U.S., Canadian, and other countries uh, to move some of their operations into Africa. There's lots of great reasons to do it. And so um, impacting the local communities with um, with dollars, I mean, let's face it, every 500 agents probably would put between 15 and $20 million into a local community. And so, you know, my, our specific impact journey was let's go for living wage versus minimum wage. Let's find a way to elevate women um, in leadership because I actually think that, you know, this is an area um, where you can really make a difference within the terms of your contracts with your BPOs to say it has to be an African woman leading my program kind of deal. Um, and then, so if we can start bringing more companies, or co uh, companies over to these countries, so South Africa, Rwanda, Ghana, um, uh, Morocco and Egypt are, are already pretty much on that that road, but there's plenty of countries where um, it does make sense to, to, to invest. Then the other side of this is, how can I help the BPOs themselves through leadership development programs that you know we can create. Uh, you know, I've been in this business a long time. I can help people be successful, and so it's impacting both country uh, companies coming over and the talent within the countries to be successful. Love it. Really, sort of closing the loop on right empathy and and really ex understanding really the agent experience and the impact through that. David, thank you for sharing a little bit more about that. Um, mm -hmm. Super excited to hear more about your work at Impactify going forward. Um, I know our showrunner here is giving me the gotta wrap up messages. <laughs> um, so we want to get people back to your lunches shortly. Um, normally, David, each week we ask each guest a rolling questions. Yours came for Joe Wang um, about effective strategies for fostering that culture of innovation and creativity. I know we've talked a good mm -hmm. bit about that. We'll post some wraps on that. But um, what would you like to ask our next guest? In customer well, service. I look in the spirit of the AI questions out there. I would love to know what's the most exciting AI advancement that you have made and implemented in the last 12 months. I too am excited to find out. Um, and with that, David, it's been super exciting and enlightening to delve into a little bit of how you integrate empathy and operational excellence at scale to create meaningful experiences for customers. Thank you for sharing your insights with us and for your dedication to enhancing customer and community experience and taking that to the next level with Impactify CX. Thank you so much for awesome. joining us. It's been a pleasure having you. Um, and to our listeners, thank you for joining us. And please do join us for the next episode of Plain Speak on June 26th, 1 p.m. Eastern with Natalie Nichols, Head of Customer Operations at Pathrise, where we'll welcome another CX expert to share their insights. Thank you for tuning in and see you next time.